we believe you to work in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 So two weeks ago, um, I began a Bible study. It was the Wednesday night before Pentecost Sunday. And I began a Bible study on why Pentecost. And just began to work through why Pentecost is so important to the church of the living God. Pentecost is not only important to Pentecostals. Pentecost is important to everybody. Anybody who claims to be a follower of Jesus Christ, Pentecost needs to have an impact in your life. Needs to have an impact in your life. And on Pentecost Sunday, we had a great day. Uh, Pastor Clinton and Pastor Austin both preached wonderful messages um, that absolutely blessed our church. So I may touch things that, that they have hit on already. They probably hit on some things that I had hit on as well. And I'm going to just go back very quickly and just remind you of a few of the key things that I said that Wednesday night two weeks ago. I talked to you about the fact that Pentecost brings people together. And I think that right now, that is something that we need to make sure is a key. Uh, it, is, it is a key emphasis that we have in the church that we need to rally around something that brings people together. Our world is torn apart right now. Uh, particularly our society here in the United States is dealing with quite a bit of upheaval and, and anger and hatred and all kinds of different emotions that are spilling forth right now. Some of those emotions were already there. Some of them were just below the surface. And some of them have, uh, they have been caused to come up because people are reacting to different things that are going on. I would say to you right now, um, with all that we're, we have going on, I want to remind you, this is something that I just have not been able to get away from for weeks now. But the Bible is very clear when it tells us to not repay evil for evil. That is not who we are. We don't repay evil for evil. We're the people who turn the other cheek. We're the people that if we're compelled to go one mile, we go two. We're the people that if somebody asks for your coat, you give them your cloak as well. That is who we are. And we need to be very, very careful that we watch our attitudes. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to deal with some things that talk about what we have to be emptied of. But we need to be very careful that our attitude, which is another way of saying our spirit is right. We must have a right spirit. Daniel, in, in uh, the Old Testament, Daniel was a man who... The Bible said he had an excellent spirit. He had an excellent spirit. That's, that has been one of, one of my prayers, is that at the end of my life, when I get to the end of whatever it is that God will do through me, in me, I pray that somebody can stand up at my funeral and say that Kenneth O'Connell had an excellent spirit, that I treated all people well, that I was kind, that I was a good Samaritan, that, that everybody was my neighbor, and I love my neighbor as I love myself. And we need to be very careful that we don't get caught up in the hyperbole, that, that radical factions on either side of us, even if there's opinions that some of those people are expressing that we may have, we need to be careful that we don't get caught up with those opinions uh, being more important to us than our Christian character. We must continue to be Christians. And I find no better place for the New Testament church to come together than in the, than, than in the path of Pentecost, where colors are washed away in the power of Pentecost. Language groups are washed away in the power of Pentecost. But in Pentecost, we are one people serving one God. We are all called of one spirit. There is not different spirit for different groups of people. One spirit. If you have that spirit, you are my brother and you are my sister. And I need to make sure that I keep my character right. And that I do not allow myself to backslide. That's what can happen if we're not careful. 
we can backslide and begin to and begin to make gods of ideologies that are surrounding us in our culture today. And the Bible says that there are so many voices in this world and none of them are without signification. You better be careful what voice you are tuning into to hear right now. So there is unity that is found in Pentecost. And we talked about that. And we talked about how that at Pentecost, after when Jesus died, the Bible says the veil was torn, which there was a couple of things that happened there. One, it was to, it was to let us know that no longer is God going to be contained in, 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 a, in a box, in a room. But God is, God is everywhere at all times. And he was going to make sure that we understood that it wasn't just one man, a high priest, that could step behind a veil and experience his Shekinah. But now we boldly can approach the throne of grace. And when I come before the presence of the Lord, I can experience, and if you were in this room on Sunday, I'm telling you, you know you experienced the Shekinah glory of God that fell on us in such a powerful and unique way. And it doesn't matter where you are. You can be in America, you can be in uh, the continent of Asia, Europe, Australia. It doesn't matter where you are, Africa, um, anywhere that people are, God can now be there because the Spirit of the Lord has been poured out. The Spirit of the Lord has been poured out. And so uh, I would tell you that Acts is, and, and this is something that I've talked about with a few friends before, but uh, let me hit it real quick. Really, Acts is the beginning of the New Testament. The Gospels, in the Gospels, Israel was still living under the law. Now, Jesus had come that he might fulfill the law. But the New Testament really begins in the book of Acts. How do you know that? Because the Bible tells us that without the death of the testator, there can be, there can absolutely not be a New Testament. And so when Jesus died at the end of the Gospels, at the end of his life, he dies and he's buried and he rises again. That is when the beginning of the New Testament really begins. And so I would tell you that Acts is to the New Testament what Genesis is to the Old Testament. When God was introduced to us in the Old Testament, he is introduced to us through the moving of his spirit. Right? He's introduced to us in Genesis through the moving of his spirit. The Bible tells us that the earth was without form. It was void and that darkness was upon the face of the deep. The Bible says that the Spirit of God moved. And it was the moving of the Spirit that set in motion the bringing in of all things into order. God's Spirit moved, then He spoke. The Spirit moved, and then He spoke. And when that happened, all things began to be brought into order. Uh, there was order that came from the chaos that was the world prior to God speaking into that world. In the book of Acts, they're gathered in the upper room. And what happens? The Bible says that suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. The Spirit of God began to move. And there appeared unto them cloven like as of fire and it's set up on each the spirit of God is moving and they began to speak with other tongues as the spirit gave them the utterance so you have that same pattern now you have to understand that our God is a God of pattern you have to remember that he is a God of pattern so the spirit moved and then the Lord spoke the spirit moved and the Lord spoke the Spirit moved in Genesis for the creation of the world, but it moved in Acts for the creation of the church. Think about this. God spoke to creation in Genesis, but He is now speaking through His creation in the book of Acts now that His Spirit has been poured out. And we are a part of that book of Acts church. Can you say amen? Wherever God's Spirit moves, 
God's Spirit will speak. And let me say this before I move on. Those who believe that the Holy Ghost was only for the apostles and only for the early church, let me ask you a question. When did the law quit becoming important for Israel? When was the law no longer important for Israel to live by? It was not important for Israel to not live by that law until the Old Testament had ended. And I am saying to you that this new uh, dispensation, this church age dispensation that we're a part of, and tongues being a part of that, all of that will continue to be important. Tongues will not cease as long as there is a New Testament church. Hear me. Tongues will not cease as evidence of the gift of the Holy Ghost as long as there is a New Testament church. Otherwise, we suddenly have a God who is departing from His pattern, and God does not depart from His pattern. Can you say amen? Amen. amen. And so, uh, having gone through that and talked about last week how um, it is imperative that we have the Holy Ghost, that we are born again of water and of the Spirit, knowing that those things are imperative and that they are important for us. And, and that when we will know we have received the gift of the Holy Ghost uh, when we speak with other tongues, because that is what happened every time people receive the Holy Ghost in your Bible. You can see it in Acts 2 and 4. You can see it in Acts 10, 44. You can see it in Acts 19. Tongues was the sign for two reasons. James tells us that the tongue is the unruliest of members. The only way to tame the tongue is by the power of the Holy Ghost. And tongues was the sign because it was prophesied in Isaiah 28 and verse number 11 that this would be the way that God would speak to his people. And so tonight, I'm moving on. I want to talk to you about this, how the Holy Ghost leads and guides us into all truth. It leads and it guides us into all truth. John chapter number 16 and verse number 13. John 16 and 13. Jesus is speaking and he says this, How be it, when he, the spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine and shall show it unto you. Now you have to remember that Jesus had already told his disciples, I don't speak just what I want to speak. What I hear the Father say, that is what I say. How can Jesus say that? Because Jesus is speaking from the perspective of his humanity. His humanity does not speak whatever his humanity wants to speak. But the spirit that indwelt him, he was Emmanuel, God with us. He was the mighty God in Christ. And whatever uh, the, the, the spirit of God that indwelt him was saying, that is what the flesh allowed to flow out of it. And so Jesus is saying that the spirit is going to come. And just as whatever flowing out of me was direct from God, Whatever flows from the Spirit will be directly from God as well. It will be directly from God as well. Let's look at Luke chapter number 4 and verse number 1. I want to read uh, just a, a few verses here to you from some different passages of Scripture. Luke 4 and 1. This is talking about Jesus um, and his after he has been baptized in the Jordan River. It says this, and Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost returned from Jordan and was led. Notice that Jesus being full of the Holy Ghost was led by the spirit into the wilderness. You cannot be led if you are not full. If we are going to be led by the Holy Ghost, we need to be full of the Holy Ghost. I'm not talking about you come to church on Sunday and talk in tongues for a little bit. 
I am talking about you live a life whereby the Spirit of God is constantly being uh, poured into you. You are constantly uh, having that river of life flow out of you. You are that cup that runs over. Uh, we, we need to be full of the Holy Ghost. When you look at Acts chapter number 2, look at Acts chapter number 2 and verse number 4. Let me get there. Acts 2 and 4. The Bible says, and this is the day of Pentecost, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. They were filled with the Holy Ghost. And when they were filled with the Holy Ghost, what began to happen? They spilled out into the street. They began to preach the gospel. They began to reach that community. They began to reach Jerusalem. Not only Jerusalem, but it spread to Samaria. And not only Samaria, but it spread to all Judea. And not only all Judea, but it spread to the uttermost parts of the earth. When they were filled with the Holy Ghost, that began to happen. They were led to begin to to preach the gospel. They were led to people that were hungry and wanted to receive what they had received. Now I'm going to Acts chapter number 6 and verse number 3. This is when the disciples were so overwhelmed with all of the things that were needing to be done that they could not accomplish all of it by themselves. So they, the 12 came together and they said, we're going to find seven men of honest report. Look at this, Acts 6 and 3. Wherefore, brethren, look you out among you seven men of honest report, full of of the Holy Ghost and wisdom who we may appoint over this business. They wanted people that were full of the Holy Ghost. Why did they need to be full of the Holy Ghost? Because they could not be led by the Holy Ghost to do the things they needed to do if they were not filled with the Holy Ghost. It is not enough for us to feel the Spirit of God occasionally, but we must be filled with the Spirit of God completely completely. Acts 7 in verse number 55, you read about Stephen, who was one of those seven. He is preaching, and while he's preaching, they become so angry with him that they begin, well, look at verse 54 of Acts 7. When they heard these things, they were cut to the heart, and they gnashed on him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looking up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Now, watch this right here. There's a couple of points I want to make. When Stephen was full of the Holy Ghost, he is, he's being gnashed on. They began to stone him. And you drop down to verse 60, the Bible says, and he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord Lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. When he said this, he fell asleep. He died. It is amazing that a man that was full of the Holy Ghost refused to allow offense to get in his heart and keep him from loving people who hated him. For him to carry an offense in his heart against them. Because he understood the problem here is not these people. The problem that we are dealing with is the fact that these people do not have a revelation of who Jesus is. They are not filled with his spirit, but I am, and so I've got to take a high road here. And if we are filled with the Holy Ghost, we will take that high road. Can you say amen? Acts chapter number 11, verse number 24. This is speaking of Barnabas. Acts 11. And I'll tell you what, I'll go to verse 23. The Bible says, Who, when he came and had seen the grace of God, was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. For he was a good man and full of the Holy Ghost and of faith, and much people was added unto the Lord. Then departed Barnabas to Tarsus for to seek Saul. That man that was full of the Holy Ghost was led of the Holy Ghost to go look for a man by the name of Saul who will become the Apostle Paul and a great, uh, and, and a great champion for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Barnabas 
reached him and began to mentor him as he was led to do so because he was full of the Holy Ghost and of faith. And so it is for this reason that Ephesians 5.18 commands us that we are to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So I'm, I'm, I'm driving that home to you tonight. We need to be full of the Spirit. As Paul told the Ephesian church, we must be filled with the Spirit. Now, the problem that we have sometimes is that in order for us to be full of His Spirit, we must be emptied of our own. We've got to be emptied of the things in us that are not like Him. This, this, this quest that we have for the fruit of the Spirit to be developed in our lives, it needs to become serious to us. It needs to become serious to us. If, if you're constantly offending somebody, something's wrong with you. If you're constantly being offended, something's wrong with you. If, if nobody can do anything right for you, something's wrong. If you're always, if, if, if you're always uh, in the mully grubs, there's you another good word. If you're always in the mully grubs, something's wrong. If, if there's no joy in your life, something's wrong. I'm going to just tell you right now, when we are filled with the Holy Ghost, we will have peace and joy and righteousness. We will have those things. We need to be filled with the Spirit. Somebody say it again. Amen. Amen. So we have to have some things emptied out of our own spirit. Joshua chapter 5 and verse number 1. The Bible tells of the Amorites. And it is when uh, they are, it's specifically referring to the fact that Israel has come through the Jordan River. You remember how the Lord told Joshua to tell the priest that they were to take the Ark of the Covenant upon their shoulders and they were to step into that river. And when their feet touched the water, the Bible says the waters parted. They went hither and thither. And they began to pile up on either side of them. And those priests went and stood in the middle of that Jordan River. And Israel walked around them, and they all went to the other side. And then after they got on the other side, uh, they took 12 stones, piled them up in the river. And then they took another 12 stones and piled them up on the bank. Because the 12 that were in the river won't, would not be seen, but the 12 that were on the bank, they would be seen. And then after those priests came out of the water... The Bible lets us know that the waters came back together. But the Jewish tradition tells us that the waters had, and, and the Bible tells us that the waters had gathered and, and pushed themselves very far back. And the Jewish tradition tells us that when those waters that had been pushed that far back came down, that it was so great that it actually caused destruction further down the river for those cities that were on the river. And when the Amorites heard what had happened, how God had brought Israel through on dry ground through that Jordan River that they knew was at a flood stage, that they knew there was no way they should have been able to do that, that it was not one or two or three or four people, but it was two or three or four million people that had come through. When they heard that, they, the Bible says, go read it, it's in Joshua 5 and 1, that they had no more spirit in them. They had no more spirit in them. Second Chronicles 9 and 4 says that when the queen of Sheba had come to prove Solomon and she would looked at all the stuff and she'd asked all the questions, the Bible says she had no more spirit in her. What happens when a person has no more spirit in them? When you have no more spirit, you don't feel like going on. When you have no more spirit, you lose all motivation. But when we are filled with his spirit, I'm going to tell you right now, something begins to happen to us. I feel a passion while I'm preaching to you right now because I know that the spirit of God is rising up in me and it causes me to want to reach for you. It causes me to want to share the word of God with you. And when we are filled with the spirit of God, something begins to happen within us. It pushes us into ministry. It pushes us to serve the kingdom of God. There is not one person in this church that should not be a servant in this church. I'm going to stop so you can clap your hands and shout for a minute. You done shouting? Go ahead. All right. I'm telling you, it, the, the only serve, serve, people who serve in this church are not pulpit ministry. 
are not people who break open the word of God to the rest of the congregation. If it's a Sunday school teacher in any age group, if it's, uh, if it's a musician, or those are not the only people who serve in this church. Everybody serves in this church. If we are filled with the spirit of God, we are going to be, we, we are going to be led to look for areas in which we can become a part of what God is doing in his kingdom, through his kingdom in the earth today. That's why they found those seven men in Acts chapter number six. So we need to be filled with his spirit. But it's hard for us to be filled with his spirit if our own spirit is causing interference. If our own spirit is causing interference. How do I know, pastor, if my spirit is causing interference between myself and what God is trying to do? I'm going to tell you right now, it's real, it really is simple to know. If, if, if there is a carnal agenda that is being pushed in your life, there's interference. If you are resisting the word of God, there is interference. I know the Bible says that, but no, 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 no. There's interference. You're not filled with the spirit. That's, you're saying some hard things. Well, maybe we need to hear some hard things. We must be filled with with the spirit of God. If, if, if you can't ever have a right attitude, it's because you've got too much of you and too little of him. If, if you get angry too easy, too easy, you've got too much of you and too little of him. If you get jealous too easy, you've got too much of you and too little of him. If nobody can say something right or you can't reconcile with somebody, there is too much of you and there is too little of him. And I'm off on stuff right now I didn't even plan to get into, but I'm doing good right now. I'm going to pat myself on the back. This is what we need to hear because we need to be a people who are right with our God. We need to be right with our God. And it's hard for me to be right with him and wrong with his church. Wrong with my brothers and sisters. God, help me. Help me, Lord, to be filled with your spirit. Being filled with the spirit is more than getting in a pulpit and hollering. Being filled with the spirit is more than singing with, with, with great ability and talent. Being filled with the spirit is more than just being the most demonstrative person in praise and worship. Being filled with the Spirit is a life that is completely led by the power of the Holy Ghost. He leads and guides us into all truth. That's why John the Baptist said, He must increase and I must decrease. Daily, there's got to be more Jesus and less Kenneth. More of him and less of me. So Lord, let your Spirit lead me. Let it guide me into all truth. Let me remind you that truth never changed. Truth has never changed. Truth is there. Truth has always been there. What changes, the only variable in, all, in that equation, the only thing that is subject to change is whether or not we open ourselves up to revelation of the truth and then walk in it. God's truth is, is settled. It is forever settled. It is, his word is yea and amen. It will not change. What does change is, is how we respond to that truth. If we receive revelation and then if we walk in that revelation. Truth is there for everybody to see. It's not there for one or two. It's there for everybody to see in God's word. The problem we encountered is that sometimes it is veiled to us through our own opinions, through our own feelings, through traditions that we may have been exposed to. I was talking to someone before service tonight. I was talking to someone before church tonight. And I was telling them that I have a concern that we are seeing the erosion of freedom of speech in our country. And, you know, maybe that's okay with you when you like what they're not letting somebody else say. It probably doesn't bother you when that's the case. And if, if, if they refuse to let anybody go out and say anything against the word of God and against God, well, I'd, I'd like that. I'll just be honest with you. I'd like that. But what's scaring me is that 
uh, as they begin to censor people and, and they begin to have their, their own fact, check, fact checkers and their own arbiters of, of what is true and what is not true, I'm, I have a concern that we're not very far from them calling us preachers who preach this book and, and when we post something and when we have a service like this on Facebook like we're having right now, that they say, you can't say that. We don't consider that to be true. And I don't think we're probably just too terribly far from living in that kind of a society. And our children are perhaps really going to be exposed to that kind of a society. We better make sure that we are not allowing anybody else to determine for us what is truth. I want the Spirit of God to lead me and guide me into all truth, and He cannot do that if I don't open up His Word and allow His Word to speak to me and His Spirit to deal with me. And wherever you are, you ought to clap your hands, give God some praise. As that veil in the tabernacle was rent, so too must the veil of our own perceptions and ideologies and worldly philosophies be rent. Some of us like the idea of a separation between God and certain areas of our life. There are people who like that. They like to compartmentalize Him and not feel like our relationship with Him is affected when we do certain things or when we live certain ways. When America was founded, there was a separation of church and state. It meant that the state was not to impose on the church, and the church was not to impose on the state. Well, that may work, and I'm not convinced it does, but that may work for America, but it does not work with God. He refuses to be disenfranchised from any area of your life. That's why the Bible challenges us so much. Because he insinuates himself into how we do, how we speak, how we act, how we look, how we even think. He puts himself in all those areas. And I heard something the other day. It was very good, and I'm going to share it with you. Somebody said, We've got to, we, we need to change how we prioritize. We, what we do is we, we say, I'm going to prioritize God up here, and then my family, and then the church, and then you know whatever else, job, and all these other things. And they said the problem with that is you have people that say, I'm going to put God first. But when they do that, they mean I'm going to leave him out of my family and I'm going to leave him out of my my job. And I'm going to leave. No, no, no. God wants to be involved in the center of all that you have to do with. He wants to be the center of everything that you touch, everything that you are involved with, every relationship you have. Jesus needs to be the center. Everything you do, Jesus needs to be at the center of it. Every decision that you make, Jesus must be at the center of it. So truth never changed, but it has been progressively revealed to us. God didn't give it to them all at once. He told them, I'm not going to give it to you all right now. And the development of the New Testament is proof of this. It was written over an elongated period of time because God was walking them through many different things, and he continues to walk his church through many different things. I'm going to move on here. Uh, Let me tell you what else the Holy Ghost will do for you. It will bring comfort. And it will cause us to rejoice in the presence of Jesus. John chapter number 16, verses 16 through 22. A little while, Jesus said, and you shall not see me. And again a little while, and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. Then said some of his disciples among themselves, What is this that he saith unto us? A little while, and you shall not see me. And again a little while, and you shall see me, because I go to the Father. They said, therefore, what is this that he saith a little while? We cannot tell what he saith. Now, Jesus knew that they were desirous to ask him. And he said unto them, Do you inquire among yourselves of that I said? A little while, and you shall not see me. And again a little while, and you shall see me. Verily, verily, I say unto you, that you shall weep and lament, but the world shall rejoice, and you shall be sorrowful, but your sorrow shall be turned into joy. 
A woman, when she is in travail, had sorrow because her hour is come. But as soon as she is delivered of the child, she remembers no more the anguish for joy that a man is born into the world. And ye now therefore have sorrow, but I will see you again. And your heart shall rejoice, and your joy no man taketh from you. Now, the Holy Ghost is referred to as the Spirit of Christ. And I submit that Jesus was telling the disciples that although he would not be with them physically, they would sense his presence when the Holy Ghost would come to them as if he was right there with them. And he said, there is going to be a space where you're going to be sorrowful because I go away. But just hold on a little while because not too many days hence, you shall be endued with power when the Holy Ghost is come upon you. I'll get the power in a moment. The Holy Ghost is going to come upon you. And when his presence came, he told them that it would bring joy with it. I am so thankful for the comfort. I am so thankful for the joy that is found in the Holy Ghost. I want to live that kind of a life. I'm not talking about always having the answers. I don't always have the answers. I can't give you all of the answers. I can't tell you why you haven't been healed and somebody else has been healed. I cannot tell you why you've gone through financial difficulty and somebody else seems to be more blessed than they've ever been. I can't explain all of those things to you, but I can tell you this. If you really get filled with the Holy Ghost, it doesn't matter if it's richer or it's kind of like getting married. It, 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 it's in richer or poor, in sickness or or in health, if it goes good, or if it doesn't go good. I count it all joy, is what the Apostle Paul said. I've been through shipwrecks. I'm not supposed to be preaching. I'm supposed to be teaching. I even sat in a chair so I wouldn't get to preaching, but here I go. Paul said, I've been in shipwrecks. I've been beaten. I've been chased out of town. I've had everything that can go wrong. I've been hungry. I've been thirsty. I've been a night and a day in the deep. I've had, I've been, I, I've had stripes laid on my back. All of these things have come against me. Nevertheless, I count it all joy. How are you going to do that, Paul? Because I am filled with the gift of the Holy Ghost. I'm full of the Spirit. Wherever I go, I'm full of the Spirit. Whatever I do, I'm full of the Spirit. And as long as I've got the Spirit, I've got joy, I've got comfort, I've got peace. Hallelujah. The Holy Ghost gives power. Would you say power? The Holy Ghost gives power, Acts 1 and 8. But ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria, and the uttermost part of the earth. When we receive the Holy Ghost, we receive power. We receive power to witness, first of all. That should be the first thing we're empowered to do. I don't care how many devils you can cast out if you don't witness to people. I, ooh, come on now. I don't, I don't care any of the other things you can do if you don't, do not have a hunger to see people saved. We receive power to become witnesses. And if you're going to exercise any part of Holy Ghost power, that's the first one you need to be exercising. He gives us power to witness, but not just to witness. He does give us power over unclean spirits. I have seen people with unclean demonic spirits either in them or on them. I've, I've watched as those spirits were given up. They came out of them or they were loose from the power of them. I've watched it happen through the power of the Holy Ghost. I have watched the manifestation of the gifts of the Spirit. As we had happened in this church on Sunday, we had tongues and interpretation of tongues that took place in this room. I have watched word of faith go forth. I have had words of wisdom come forth, word of knowledge to come forth. I have seen the gifts of faith. I have seen gifts of healing and miracles happen when the power of the Holy Ghost was poured out and people were filled with the Spirit of God. 
I am telling you that why Pentecost? Because I want to be a part of a supernatural church. Why Pentecost? Because I want to be a part of a church that is not held back by demonic oppression. I want to be a part of a church. You could put this church in the middle of any city. I don't care if it's the Prince of Babylon. I don't care if it's the Prince of Persia. I don't care if it's the Prince of Jonesboro. You can drop the church anywhere. And because the church has Holy Ghost power, the church will be triumphant. The church will be triumphant. Matthew 4, 1, Romans 8, 14 lets us know that the Holy Ghost gives us direction. I won't, I'm not going to move on that because I've touched on some of that. Uh, But let me end with this. Romans 8 and 26. Romans 8. And verse number 26. This is a very powerful part of being filled with the Holy Ghost. Why Pentecost? Why Pentecost, Pastor? Because sometimes I don't have the answers. And because sometimes in my flesh I'm weak. And sometimes I have infirmities. I'm not talking about being spiritually weak. I'm talking about coming to the limitation of what my flesh can do. I come to the end of myself. And when I come to the end of myself, this is what the Apostle Paul said in Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities. For we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And he that searcheth the hearts knows what is the mind of the Spirit because he maketh intercession for the saints according to the will of God. The last thing I'm going to tell you about why Pentecost is because when you have had Pentecost come and you are filled with the Holy Ghost, you have access to to the Holy Ghost, for the Spirit of the Lord to begin to pray through you. I thank God for what we're able to pray. We need to open up our own mouths and pray with our understanding at times. There, are, there need to be days when you, when you call some things specifically. You have not because you ask not. We need to open up our mouths and verbalize some of our prayers. Well, I pray in my mind. God knows my mind. Yes, he knows your mind. But there is power in you praying out loud. And every, I've I've said this before, but I'm going to remind you, every recorded prayer that we have in the Bible, the reason it's recorded is because it was able to be recorded because somebody said it out loud. There is power in praying out loud. When we pray with our children, we, we tell our kids, we're going to pray out loud. We're not just going to be quiet about this. Well, that's, I think that's a little... Well, I'm teaching my kids now so that when they find themselves at a point in life where they cannot depend on the prayers of mom and dad, when they cannot depend upon my prayer because I'm not there and I don't know what's going on and they need God to move right now. I want my kids to know how to call out to the Lord and for him to hear them. And he'll do that. But let me tell you something else. There are going to be days when you're going to say, God, I'm here, but all I know is I feel a burden. All I know is I feel like there's something coming against us. I don't know what it is. All I know is that I need to pray. And it is in those moments that as we begin to pray and we yield to the Spirit because we are full of the Holy Ghost. Why Pentecost? Because uh, when I am filled with the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of God will begin to pray through me. He will make intercession for for me with groanings which cannot be uttered and there will be ah ah and you say all they're doing is just making a groan sound it don't even there ain't even nothing there i'm telling you there is something going out there's a there's a signal from the spirit going out nobody else may understand it the angels may not understand it but the spirit searcheth the hearts of men and the spirit is praying according to the will of god 
And when the Spirit prays according to the will of God, you talk about perfect prayer. There is no prayer that is more powerful than a prayer that is led by the Holy Ghost. There is no prayer that is more powerful than a prayer that is uttered by somebody who has just yielded themselves and said, God, just come pray through me. I'm just going to be the vessel. Now you operate through me. Because the Spirit, remember what Jesus said, the Spirit is going to say the things that he says. The Spirit is going to do the things that he does. And when I pray in the Spirit, I am praying according to whatever God is saying in that moment. When I pray in the Spirit, I am saying exactly what God wants to say. And we are going to have accomplished exactly what God wants to have accomplished when we pray in the Holy Ghost. Wherever you are right now, I wish you would just begin to give God thanksgiving for the Holy Ghost that he has filled you with what he has done in your life would you just begin to give him praise for that right now hallelujah 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 oh we are so thankful for your spirit great God we are so thankful for your spirit, great God. It's when I didn't know what to do that the spirit prompted me what to do. It's when I didn't know where to turn that the spirit prompted me on where to turn. And there's been things that as I look back over those things after the fact, I didn't, I didn't know why I did it the way I did it. All I knew is that I had been praying and said, God, I just want to be yielded to you. Listen, now now you hear me. The Spirit will never tell you to do something that is contrary to this. So don't justify your flesh and say it was the Spirit. The Holy Ghost spoke to me. Don't lie. Don't be a liar. Tell the truth. Oh, here I go messing up a good message. Tell the truth. But if the Spirit's saying it, you better follow it. Spirit's doing it, you better lead it. Now, do it according to the Word of God. But let's walk in the Spirit. Let's be led of the Spirit. Let's live in the Spirit. And let's see great things accomplished through the power of the Spirit. Clap your hands and give God thanks. <laughs> Hallelujah. God bless you. Thank you for being here with us tonight on this Bible study. I apologize for our technical difficulties. That stuff happens from time to time, and, uh, and we'll try to get it fixed. Uh, there's two parts, I guess two videos to this lesson tonight, and to get all of this lesson, you'll need to watch both of these videos. And I love you. I appreciate you. I cannot wait to see you Sunday. One service at 11 o'clock, and we're going to social distance just as good as we possibly can but folks i'm telling you there's power in coming together if you can i want you to be here if you can't i understand but those of you that can i want you to be here we're going to have a great move of god god bless you in jesus name